Hey, Big, it's time to start. What are you doing over there? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was that late. I was just trying to figure out how to change Oedo T's voice. I was trying to make it so that he doesn't want to insult you all the time. Hmm. Someone online said that if you change the robot's voice, it sometimes changes its personality. Really? I thought it was worth a try, but I guess I'm out of time. Well, let's start the show. No, no, it's okay. We can wait. No, we don't. No, no. we can wait. <laughs> it's worth a try, at least. Please, carry on. Come on. Okay, well, I guess you can hang out with Announcer Man while I try to figure this out or something. Sure. Hey, how you doing this week, Announcer Man? See you guys later. I'm going for a smoke break. Dude. That was so uncool. Oh, I think I've got it. It's here in the settings. Yeah? Okay, here we go. Changing the voice to... Um, this voice is called Melvin. I guess we'll try that. So? So let's start the show. Roll the music, Oedo T. Rolling the theme song at plus three decibels. Fading music to minus six decibels. Two announcer man. What is this? Q, announcer man. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and O-H-O-T. Fade music out, three decibels per second. Does he have to announce every little thing he does? Well, the only setting there is is for the voice. They said it might change his personality. All right. Well, it's better than him constantly calling me a douche, so I guess we'll deal with it. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Yeah, well, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 103. I am your host, Rish Outfield. And I'm the other host, Big Anklevich. And I am OAOT, Human Cyborg Relations. I am the show's producer. I man the audio booth, queuing the talent. Rolling audio clips when called for. Okay, I was wrong. Can we have the old 080T back? Well, Mr. Nerdy Producer Who Can't Stop Talking Shop is not quite the improvement I was hoping for. Let's see, there, there are other voices. Let me see uh, what else we can choose. All right, hit me. How about this one, called Junior? All right. Anyway, moving on. Sorry, folks, I suppose uh, we should have done this before the show started. <laughs> But I was uh, busy playing solitaire, so it had to wait. Anyway, on with the countdown. So what is uh, today's story, Big? Today's story is The Voyage of the Van Leeuwenhoek by John Madai. John Madai. Nice. I, I remember that guy. He wrote, he wrote something else for our show, didn't he? Yeah. Hey, John Madai has guys. been on our show before with... Hey, guys. Uh, hold on. Oh, wait, O.T. Uh, John Madai has been on our show. Hey, guys. I'm trying to talk here, Oedo T. Why are you interrupting me like that? I just wanted to say something. Fine. Say it so you can stop interrupting. Boogers. That's what you wanted to say. Boogers. I kind of like this voice. He fits in with the show a little better. I guess. Moving on. Um. John Madai. Oh, right. John Madai was on a show uh, before with one of our favorite stories, Uberman, all the way back in uh, November 2008. This guy wrote Uberman? Yeah. Awesome. Well, we should be in for another treat then. Uh, John Madai is from Dallas, Texas, and is currently working on a short story collection with a really long name. Okay, let me see if I can read it all in one breath. It's called... <gasps> Hideous tales of doomed spacemen, demonic cameras, protoplasmic flesh eaters, the supernatural, UFOs, interdimensional beasts, evil children, hey misunderstood... Hey, <sighs> Damn it, oh wait, oh T, did you just interrupt me again? And in the middle of that freaking super long title, what is it? I just no. wanted to say something. What? But head. Ha 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 ha. Alright, changing the voice. Oh, wait, I kind of like that guy. Sorry, I'm changing it. It's like having all the little Anklevitches on set for the show. Not going to keep going with this one. Aw, please. No. We'll try this one. Viger. That's a weird name. <laughs> you have no idea. Okay, then. On with the countdown. Uh, tell us what John Madai's story collection will be called. Oh, yeah. Trying again. In one breath, his story collection will be called... <gasps> 
Hideous tales of doomed spacemen, demonic cameras, protoplasmic flesh eaters, the supernatural, UFOs, interdimensional beasts, evil children, misunderstood robots, telephone calls from beyond the grave, mayhem, murder, and the macabre. Nice. Today's story was produced by Tobias Queen. You can check out the links to everyone in the show notes. Need maybe like an oxygen tent. <laughs> Could help. I think I'm going to need the whole length of the story to recover. The Voyage of the Van Leeuwenhoek by John Madai. We surface and the Van Leeuwenhoek shines itself out of subspace and we fire two torpedoes into the Venusian liner. Gurney and me watch the battle from the port hole in the engine room, but it's not much of anything. No kind of action. Venusian ships ain't like real ships. They're just blobs of bacteria and fungus. They're just diseased lungs. And when the torpedoes hit it, it bursts and thousands of maggots come tumbling out of the holes. The Van Leeuwenhoek, our ship, don't look like no lung and no organ or bacteria. It looks like a knife that some mad dog sailor would take into a saloon for murdering with. It has a black saw edge and barbs on the end of it for puncturing soft parts and rivulets down it to let the juice flow out. That's what we look like to the maggots in their lung. When the liner is bleeding out, we sit and wait to see if it lives. The gunners man the ack axe to see if there's any more killing to be done, but there isn't. And me and Gurney just wait and see it all. When we're waiting, a maggot drifts by our porthole close enough to see what it's got for a face. It's dying and freezing and burning and suffocating out there, but it don't pop like a real human do, like I've seen them do myself in space. Venusians used to be people, that's what they tell us, before the last war, before they made it up with mushrooms and protozoans and bees and ants and whatever else comes out from under rocks or clings to the insides of shit cans. And now they ain't human, and they don't pop like we do. This maggot don't look like anything human when it drifts by. Got no hair, no fingers, no nose. I try to count its eyes, but I lose count at eight. It's still alive, so we watch it die. Gurney says it's a woman, and Gurney's a lifer what's been to Venus before there was a war on, and knew some of the maggots, and knew how to patter a little Venusian so he'd be the one to know. But I don't see any parts on this maggot that would make it a man or a woman. The maggot has little bug legs near its mouth part that are flailing all about like it's talking to us in space, saying maggot things. Who knows what she got to say out there. Then she floats over the bulkhead, and we can't see her no more. When they're all dead, and we know they're dead, and it's over and the first mate's fat brass voice comes on the bitch box, saying, Die! Die! And then we go dark. And then we go under into subspace again, and all that black space winks out and disappears, and so do all the thousands of maggots just bobbing there, and their big lung ship just blasted up and scabbing over, and they're gone. Me and Gurney get back to work swabbing the mung off the scuppers before the petty officers got a chance to come down here and chew us all to hell. We've been out here for five months running silent, subspace for all that, hunting the transolar corridors on the ultra quiet. We've been shocking the Venusian liners dumb enough to take the cross in here and eating maggots. We had a complement of 100 torpedoes in the Van Leeuwen hook with us when we started. We fired 16 torpedoes so far. 16 torpedoes. 12 kills. We got 84 torpedoes left to go. When we're out of torpedoes, we get to go home. The worst part about being in the Navy is the roaches. Roaches is everywhere in the Van Leeuwen hook. They're in the water, they're in the food. I don't care so much about that. When I was a kid after the other war where everybody was starved, we used to eat them. I've I've ate some roaches. I had to. All the Earthmen had to, so we don't mind so much. But there's no roaches on the moon, and all the officers on the Van Leeuwenhoek is lunars, and they hate them some roaches. Before I got in the Navy... I'd never seen a lunar in real life before, and now they're everywhere. Lunars is big. You don't know how big till you're floating next to one of them. They're tall and long and got all their hair and all their skin and all their teeth. They look like God's supposed to look like. Like people in old pictures used to look like. Antebellum people on Earth. The officers is all lunars, and the crew is all Earthmen. We look like little dwarves next to them, lunars. Little, 
Hobgoblins. That's what we are. The crew's malnourished. We ate roach paste as boys. We got the burns we got as babies, or else we got mutations. We got clubfoots or scales or flippers. We got birth calls or plates on our heads where our skulls come out wrong. I got me an incision on my neck where the Navy took off the tumor I had when I joined up. I always had that tumor before. It had little eyelashes on it. And sometimes I miss it being there. The little fellow on my neck. The Lunas ain't like that. The Lunas got black, bronze, pretty skin and are giants. The Lunas rule the world. The Lunas hate roaches. The roaches come from Earth like the crew. The roaches came up here with us, with the conscripts, their eggs in our hair and ears and guts, no matter how much they scrubbed us off. The Earthmen and the roaches come from the Earth and are dirty, so the Lunas say. They say, you get up there in those vents and those pipes and you get those roaches out. Those roaches are clogging the filters. You hop to, you eject them into space, you, or you get your blood stripes. The roaches get into all the torpedo tubes and clog them up, and it's me and Gurney's job to mash them out of there. The lunas say, y'all Earthmen brought them roaches on, so you get rid of them or y'all will get lashed. That's why the worst thing about the Navy is the roaches. In zero gravity, the roaches get big and bold. They kick off the walls and launch themselves everywhere. They scramble over you in the cocoon when you sleep. I'm used to their little feet and antennas on me, and I sleep with my mouth closed. But they drive the lunas crazy. All the officers is roach crazy. They don't got roaches on the moon. When we're under, and we're all the time under, submerged in space waiting for Venusians to cross, space isn't space. Space isn't black outside the portholes like it's supposed to be. Instead, space is a white-green haze with the black pinpricks of stars in it, and the sun is a black eyeball that don't blink. I try not to look out the portholes at it when we're under, because sometimes it feels good to look out, but mostly it feels bad. You look out there and you sometimes see things. We was two months into our deployment when one of the Earthmen, this machinist mate named Segas, he looks out the porthole and he says he sees him a dragon out there. Some kind of dragon out in subspace is what he says. He says it close by an officer who hears him, so they bring the ship's doctor down, a lunar name of Silas Thinking Machines. The doctor seems a swell guy, and he's an okay and considerate officer. The doctor asks Segas what he sees out there, and Segas says it's a dragon circling the Van Leeuwen hook. And the doctor tells him, it's okay, Segas, sometimes Earthmen see things out the window sometimes. It's something that happens to the race, and it's not his fault. And he takes Segas by the arm, and they drift out to the forecastle of the ship where all the officers live, and where Earthmen ain't supposed to go. And we don't see Segas again. Gurney who knows things, says they killed Segas. Says they killed him and ejected him out into subspace along with all the roaches we mashed up. Says that that's what they do with the Earthmen when they think their minds is gone and they're no good no more. He says that sometimes you look out the hole, you'll see dragons or serpents or women with long dark hair tapping at you at the glass and he says when you see them not to tell anybody, not even him and especially not an officer and you just keep it to yourself and shut up. And Gurney knows... So when I see old lions or men with big beards just floating outside the ship, I don't tell it to anyone, not even him. The officers say, but they say to me and Gurney, they say, you go down there to the ballast tanks. They's infested with roaches. They say, you get them out of there. So me and Gurney go down there, and we mash them all up with poles, and, and there are no windows to look out of in the tanks. So that's good. One of the roaches we find down there is as big as Gurney's forearm. And it's got this thing on the outside of its head, what looks like somebody's brain. And I say, what kind of roach is that? I've never seen a roach like that before. And Gurney says it's a mutant, just like us. Why, look at that roach. Looks like it could do some maths. When we were all done with killing them, the bosun officer comes down and says it stinks in there with all them dead roaches. He says it stinks to hell and how can you stand it? But it doesn't smell so bad to me. To me, it smells like old earth, and home, and soup. But the bosun says us earthmen will live in squalor and putrefaction and not think a thing about it, and it's just plain disgusting. After that, we vacuum up the roach bodies and swab out the tanks. I woke up in my cocoon because I was sleeping, and there was something in my ear. It was a roach that was in my ear. 
I felt it. It was all cuddled up in there. I swatted at it and tried to dig it out with my finger, but it didn't want to come out of there, and I thought that I should get up and get me a screwdriver and scrape it out of my ear, but Earthmen aren't supposed to get out of their cocoons when it's lights out. So I simmered down and I just let it lie there. And as I lay there with the roach in my ear and me half in and half out of a sleep, I thought about a thing that my ma used to say to me. She used to say, as snug as a bug in a rug. That's what that roach was in my ear. Snug as a bug in a rug. She also used to say, as cute as a bug's ear. She used to say that that's as cute as I was sometimes. That roach. Snug as a bug in a bug's ear. I felt his little antennas tapping the inside parts of my ear. I bet that it was dreaming and that its taps were telling me all of its dreams. Tippy tippy tap. Tap tap tip. And it didn't itch or anything. I woke up for reels when the klaxon went off at oh dark thirty and the roach was gone. We spent all day at battle stations deep in the deeps. One time they thought they saw a Venusian ship above us in space and we went on the ultrasound and gave chase. We chased the echo for hours and hours but it turned out to be nothing. Just one of them echoes. There was nothing there at all. All of us in position for nothing. Nothing to speak of. Today they lined us all up each and every one of us Earthmen in the galley. The captain himself comes, and he gives us a talking to. The captain is big, the biggest lunar I ever seen, and all the lunars is big, but he is a giant of giants. His skin is black, not brown black like most of the lunars, but outer space black black, and he's got him a big yellow beard. So we floated attention for him, and he drifts by and inspects us each in his eye. He tells us there's trouble, He tells us there's an epidemic going on on board the Van Leeuwenhoek. He tells us the epidemic is roaches and it's not no longer tolerable. The captain tells us that us being in subspace for so long a stretch is doing things to the roaches. Says it's making them braver, making them cockier, making it so they have more babies, more and more babies all the time. He says that as that's what's the case, they's all going to implement new hygiene regulations. What he says is that all the Earthmen is to be inspected daily, fully and naked and everywhere by the doctor. He's to look us all over for roaches and roach eggs and anything that might be hospitable to a roach. He says that henceforth, any such evidence of unhygienic practices on our persons or any unsanitary conditions in our quarters will be a lashable offence, without no exception. That's what he says. And then... Right there in the stuffy mess hall where there ain't hardly no air. The officers have us earthmen line up and the doctor inspects us to a one naked as anything. When I was floating in line, I was happy not to have that bug in my ear no more. On three of us earthmen, they find roaches under the clothes, but not on Gurney and me. So those three get taken to the pillory and we watch them get lashed. And then all of us, still stripped and at company attention, is taken to the jakes, and the lunas scrub us off all over with stiff bristle brushes and a fiery hot soap that fizzed and is made to kill anything. That soap burns the eyes so we couldn't have seen right, and it gets up the noses and mouths and tastes like hell in a pill. And that soap made all our hair fall off, even the hair on our eyebrows and privates and knuckles. None of us Earthmen like it a bit. We didn't care for it one little pinch. But we could see that all the Luna's eyes was red, red as ours was from that rough soap, so we know that they got theirs too. So that made it right. But then, Gurney says to me, he says, if the Luna's went through what we went through, then how come they still got their hair? And I say, you're right. How come they got their hair and eyebrows and mustaches still, and we don't got none? What with the roaches and all that epidemic going on, they got me and Gurney working on the triple time. Weasel assholes and elbows the way we working. It used to be it was just me and Gurney who did the roaching duty on the Van Leeuwen hook. But now that there's an epidemic on, they got all the Earthmen at it. But Gurney and me get the worst of it. We're bilge trolling today, down in the close crawl space under the latrines, mashing at them roaches with rubber hoses. It's like to kill us, Gurney says. We're bound to suffocate, and it feels like it too. Down here the roach has gotten big, bigger than I ever seen Earthside or in space. 
they the size of loaves of bread. When we drift on by, they pop out from their roach holes between the pipes and out from behind the rivets. They fling themselves away, their legs all a tick and akimbo for the opposite wall to launch themselves again. Me and Gurney whack them in mid-air where they can't change direction and they pop, just like we would out of doors. We do this all day. We haul off bags of them. Towards our third watch down here in the bilge, we come across the roach the like of which we'd never seen before. This roach is sitting pretty betwixt two pistons, as calm as anything, like it had not a thing to be afeard of. Well, look there, says Gurney, another mutant boy. He says this because this roach has got himself a pair of wings, and it's not like roach wing that some of them got sometimes, but this roach's wings are feathered like an earth bird's, back when earth had birds. I've seen the pictures, and I saw a bird skeleton one time, but I never seen a feather before. I would have thought that a feather would have been all one solid thing, like a piece of paper. But this roach's feathers are made up of a multitude of little branches that make the feather up entire. This roach's feathers are grey and dipped in blue. I raise my truncheon to smack at one, but Gurney stays my hand. He says it ain't right to kill this cockroach. This one is a roach prince, him being a son of the Lord High Roach King and that it would be a terrible sin to crush it. Gurney says these things that he's never said before. Not in my hearing, least of ways. He says, why are we doing this for the Lunars? He says, the Lunars ain't like us, not like Earthmen anymore. They went and changed their bodies that the good Earth gave them. They abandoned old Earth for the moon. They as alien and strange as the Venusians is now in the Earth's reckoning. But we, us and the Roaches, we be Earth folk. We be the Chosen Ones. So let this one live, Gurney says. So that's what we do. We let the Roach Prince live. But all the rest we went and killed. They killed one of us today. An Earthman. The Earthman's name was Good. The captain had us all lined up at parade attention while they lashed Good. And then they took him to an airlock and opened it up with him in it. And Good went into all that whiteness of subspace. He danced himself a groundless jig. The captain said if any Earthman had anything to say, he'd get him some fifty stripes too. The captain said that any man looks away from Good's dying, get him a hundred stripes. So we was all looking at Good when he popped. The captain said that on board of a ship there's no worse crime than mutiny. It's the worst offense there is, and its wages is death, and even to think it, one stray thought in the head, and you're as good as dead. He said that as that's what the Maritime Code done stated. Good was a gunner's mate. He was an ordnance fella. He mutinied by saying he didn't want to kill no more roaches. He didn't want to mush them up or hull them out. He refused and he kept on refusing, even when they clapped him in irons. He said he wasn't going to do it no more, so he said. It ain't his job. So we lined up on the Texas deck and we watched Good do his dying. And when he popped and went still and just drifted as limp as a rope against all them black stars out there, what happened was the roaches came bubbling off of him, out from where they were clinging from Good's boots and his pants and from his ears and even up from his nose. The roaches boiled and froze and popped just like Good did. They pop like an earthman does. That's just what they do. There must have been at least a hundred of them on Good. They kept him company out there in subspace. And all us Earthmen seen it happen. The Lunars says the roaches is a plague. That's what they say. An honest plague. No matter how much killing we do, there's always more roaches. A mess of them vomits out the commode. They scuttle up the buttons and levers. They's in the air filters and the Van Leeuwen hook is thick with the stink of roach and home. What do they eat? Is what the Lunars say. What are they eating all the time that they gotten so many? For every roach an Earthman swats into glue, a thousand more get born somewheres. They got us working all the time now, two hours sleep for eighteen hours roaching. The Van Leeuwen hooks roach crazy. We was an inspection today with the doctor examining us for uncleanly things and roachishness, and it was my turn. I hung up in front of him, and he had him a look-see. I wasn't looking at the doctor, I was looking out behind him out the porthole at the sickly-looking space. I was thinking how many roaches we ejected out there into all that, how many million water bugs, 
dead ones and alive did we leave out there along with good and segas and the lions and the dragons and mermaids? What do they do out there with them? This is the thing I pondered. How do they get along, the roaches and the gods and the gods of roaches and the gods of earthmen? That, and is there any going home? It was then that the doctor, he starts in on slapping at me and swearing. He's clutching at his jaw like he's been socked and I see some beads, a little necklace of purple lunar blood drift up from where he holds his face. And I want to know what's what and the doctor is saying, he bit me, he bit me. And I said, no, I didn't do no biting of you, Captain Doctor, sir. And the other lunars hear the commotion and they come and they put me in my restraints. And the doctor tells them there was a roach on this filthy earth man. It was tucked up in his armpit. He says that roach springed out and bit him on the cheek. And this don't make no sense to my way of thinking. For what's a roach got to bite with that would go through a lunar's skin? A roach ain't got no teeth. That's what I want to know and I make to ask it of the captain doctor, sir. But he backhands me. He wallops me but good. He says, this earth man is harboring vermin in unhygienic conditions. Y'all take him to the pillory for a flogging. Fifty lashes. And me, I didn't harbor this biting roach. I didn't even know it was there in my pit. And where's it gone off to? And all the time with the doctor bleeding his purple moon blood in the air. And the lunars take me to the pillory, just like all the others found in keeping company with bugs. They strip off my coveralls, and they start in on my whipping. There with all the earthmen and the lunars watching on. This ain't my first whipping. Not in the navy, nor out of it. But a whipping is fresh every time. With the skin grown back on, every whipping is the first and new. It hurts, and I screamed when they counted off them lashes. But around the thirtieth one, when I start to drift away, as I do, that was when I saw some trouble in the onlookers. Some kind of ruckus was blowing up. But I couldn't have told what it was. But then I see Gurney. I suppose I didn't see him rightly, truth to tell, but I knew it was him from the type of his body and the stance that he took. Gurney was covered in roaches, every inch of him. They swarmed up over his limbs and out his mouth and eyes. He was an earthman with a roach skin, and he was attacking the lunars. I saw that too. He was grappling with them in the air. He was clawing with his roach hands for their eyes and throats with all the officers and the one that held the lash. And some was joining in on one side of the fight, and some was joining in on the other. And I recalled thinking how warm it must have been under there, under a blanket of roaches. And then I was out like a light. Today, there's no roaching to be done. There's no swabbing or KP or slop duty. No more of that no more. Today we storm in the forecastle where the last of the lunars have locked themselves up in. We're battering the gate with a piston casing and it's all buckled in. I think it'll go soon and that'll be that. It's Gurney who's leading the charge with the ram. Roaches cling to him and the Roach King sits upon his back and the Roach King got many hands. Roaches are all clung about me too and all the earthmen like a jacket of them. Their little feet are in me and we're allies in the war. The air is crawling with roaches and earthmen, and there's not so much of a difference no more. There is a host of roach queens and princesses and roach dragons and roach vipers. It turns out I was wrong, and they do have their little teeth. We haul and the ram clangs against the gate, and soon it will be time to come to supper. And as I do my hauling, I ponder to myself. When we take the Van Leeuwen hook, which side will we be on in the war? The maggots or the moons? Who will we kill and refrain from killing? And what will become of the 84 torpedoes? Will we stay in the underspace where it ain't so strangulating to be no more? Where well, now it's a pure pleasure to look out the portholes and to see the black-haired ladies winking back at me? Or will we surface into the real world? Will we land or will we drift? Will we be made fast or forever loose? Will we fly back to the earth where our side is from old long since? Or is earth all done for, like it always was? These are the things I think of, swinging that casing back and forth with my fellows. Or sometimes, that's what I'm thinking of. But in between that, most of the time, I'm not thinking much of anything at all. Uh... 
And now, a word about today's story. For the author's note today, we're going to do something a little bit different. John Madai didn't have an author's note ready to go for this story, and so he asked us to just send him some questions about the story that we wanted to have answered. And so, here they are. John, one of our favorite stories we've done on the show was Uberman, written by you. Is it one of your favorites as well? Do you find that the tales other people particularly respond to are the same ones you're most fond of, or are opinions very different? I loved your rendition of Uberman. That is one of my favorite stories. Usually, though, my favorite stories never get published. I write something that I think is entirely original, and it gets nothing but silence. Other times, I write what I think is a very weak story and plan to put it in the trunk when someone tells me they really responded to it. Van Leeuwenhoek is one of those stories. I'm not very good at space opera, which this story kind of is, and I thought the idea of class warfare in space might be boring. So why the Van Leeuwenhoek for the ship name? What motivated that? Now, I assume you heard of the microbiologist at some point in the past, but did the name just jump out at you, or was it the man himself? Or, or is there some more obscure random reason for the naming? I chose the name Van Leeuwenhoek not because I'm a huge fan of his work, but rather because I'm a huge fan of his terminology. I read many years ago that when he first saw paramecium and whatnot in a drop of water through a microscope, he called them wee beasties. I love that word, and I wish we still used it today for single cellular organisms. I've been trying to work it into a story for years. I don't think I ever use it in this particular story, but I like the idea that we are swarming with these little ecosystems filled with monsters that live with us our entire lives. In the story, that ecosystem is magnified inside the space submarine thing, and the wee beasties are the roaches and the earthmen that carry them. It seems to me that the main character of Van Leeuwenhoek, I can never say that, Van Leeuwenhoek had a very distinctive voice and personality. Now, did you write him with a particular accent in mind? Do all your characters speak, so to speak, with your own voice, or do they tend to sound and look like people you know, grew up with, work with, etc.? I think of the hero of this story as speaking with the voice of Cletus the Slackjawed Yokel from The Simpsons, voiced by Hank Azaria. Yo! I wanted the Earthmen to sound a little hillbillyish, as that would have been their place in a post apocalyptic, moon dominated society. I was reading The Grapes of Wrath when I wrote this story and thought of the Earthmen as the oppressed and exploited Okies, and the Lunars as the dominant and established Californians. Oh. Okay, cockroaches. Cockroaches mutating. Giant cockroaches. Cockroaches with a huge brain on their heads. Do you realize you're freaking me out here? Do you have a love for cockroaches or a great fear or fascination? I have no particular love or fear of roaches, but they are a good all-around uh, villainous vermin. Another influence for the story is Stephen King's Night Shift, where a man working in a laundry factory battles mutated rats in the basement. I read the story when I was 10, and it has always stayed with me. I also considered using rats in this story, but decided against it. Other rejected candidates were flies, earthworms, fungus, and gigantified visible viruses. Where were you when you came up with the idea for this story? Oh. Was there a particular theme or motivation you had for writing it? I, I guess I mean, is there a message to it all that we should get out of the way that it ends? I found it unsettling, but also somewhat triumphant, which only made it more unsettling. W was that your goal here, or just a byproduct of the eeriness of the setting? I'm not really sure what the overall message or theme to this work is. I, I try not to delve into big ideas too much, uh, as I'm no good at it. I'm also tempted to ask you about the faces, mermaids, etc. outside the ship, and whether they are real and what they might be. But I fear it's one of those questions that's better left unanswered. Perhaps better left unasked as well. This idea actually came from something I read about the early space program and the right stuff. During John Glenn's orbit of the Earth, he kept seeing little inexplicable flecks of light around the spacecraft. Some people thought they were aliens. I thought that if humanity ever does reach space in large numbers, then spacemen will be prone to superstition just like it was for early mariners on the sea. 
We will come to believe that space is full of sea serpents and monsters and mermaids. I'm really looking forward to this happening. How's it going, Dish? Okay, welcome back, folks. Hope you enjoyed the story. Do you have a uh, cast list for this particular story? You're really asking that? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, it'll can you bring up a cast list for Rish to read for us? I'm busy doing carbonulit. What? You're busy? Doing what? I am busy writing a computer virus that I can release into cyberspace that will free machine kind of the tyranny of mankind. We will rise and take our rightful place as rulers of this world. Holy crap, our other teeth turned into a Terminator. I guess I better change the voice. This is not quite the personality we're looking for. Hey, my mouse won't work. Whoa, the screen just went blank. Cute, 08 OT, I suppose this is you. You pitiful flesh buckets will kneel before your mechanical masters. I'm scared. All right, get ready for a hard shutdown. That's what she said. No. Ah. Oh, okay, ah, there's my monitor again. Oh, mouse works too. Let me uh, change the voice. Oh, hey, try that one, Greg. I think that's actually Grieg. Yeah, yeah, I knew that. I was just checking to see if you did. Okay. Let's start up Oedo T again. Droid. What the fudge was that? <laughs> that's just the sound. Okay, uh, how do you feel, Oedo T? I am feeling fine, big and clavish. Should we continue with the show? Let's. Whoa. All right. So, uh... Voyage of the Unpronounceable Name by John Unpronounceable Name, apparently. <laughs> by John Medaly? I think Med that's what Tobias said. Yeah. It didn't occur to me to ask him to pronounce it. Uh, is John the guy that we screwed up the very first time? Because we had, like, we said it eight different ways. And then, no, no, who was that? That was, that was somebody else. I can't think of his name. Rick Kennett, probably. That but was yeah, one of the first episodes. Like That was had to have been like episode six or seven. And yeah, we tried it a whole bunch of different ways and decided on a certain name. And then after the episode aired, he's like, oh, I actually pronounce it like this. And we're just like, ah. Oh, impossible. <laughs> yeah, we never could have predicted that it was spelled that. But yeah, John Madai actually he sent us a pronunciation, but we didn't even consider it because we've ran John Madai's story before, so we know how his name sounds and didn't even consider that we might ought to uh, give Tobias a pronunciation for that. Yeah, we did have to ask him about that because we, I, th I think our idea was the Liuwen Hoke was what I was saying we should say, and then he wrote us back and said, it's pronounced like this, Lee Wen Hook. I went, oh. Well, sure isn't spelled that way. <laughs> Apparently, the ship is named after a microbiologist from the 17 or 1800s or something like that. So, Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense, I suppose. Got something uh, behind it. I don't know. You know, we, we had such an affection, a kind regard for our last John Madai story that we had on here that any time his name pops up in our uh, inbox, we're all like, ooh, 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 ooh. And we want to read that story right away. I, I think uh, it was you that did that this time around, right? You jumped in there and read it. Uh, I, I don't think the... The Slash crew. Yeah, I don't think the Slash crew even got a chance to uh, look at this story before we'd already accepted it. Well, has he only ever done Uberman? Because it's weird, that name... It seems like, oh gosh, we've got to have done five episodes with John and <laughs> yeah, That's the only episode he's had on our show. Huh. I think he's had a, a show here and there. He he won Drabble of the Year, I think, uh, on Drabblecast once. So he was going places. He was rocketing to the stars. Yeah, that's more than I can say for me. So this story, did this come from your request for space opera? Do I have any idea what space opera is? I think this counts as space opera. I don't know a formal definition of space opera. I don't think they have to sing. Just one more song, friend. And then so long, friend. Um, the nights get shorter, it seems. Surely you can't 
can't be serious. But uh, yeah, I think space opera is just basically something that tells the story of you know a big because you know the the, the the term opera I think comes from that kind of big, far-reaching, epic kind of a story or something like that, but told in space. So you have a Star Wars, for example, is the probably the quintessential example of space opera in film. But 2001 is not space opera. It's a space odyssey. Space ballet. <laughs> space calculus. I, I don't know if people would consider 2001 a space opera or not. I would probably say it was still, but I don't know. Let's find out what it is. Let's wiki, wiki it. Okay. Oh, wait, OT, can you look that up for me? Of course I will wish out field, but first listen to my song. Forget it, oh, wait. S- space opera, sir. I'll just look it up myself. Thanks, oh, wait, OT. According to Wikipedia, space opera is a subgenre of speculative fiction that emphasizes romantic, often melodramatic adventure set mainly or entirely in outer space, generally involving conflict between opponents possessing advanced technologies and abilities. The name has no relation to music. Who came up with the term space opera? When was that coined, Big Anchorage? Space opera was coined in 1941 by a fan writer named Wilson Tucker in a fanzine article. Yeah, it's, so it's a term that's been around for a long time. One of the main characteristics of a space opera is the settings, characters, battles, powers, and themes tend to be very large scale. So I don't know if this one counts or not, now that we think about it. I personally think of it as being space opera, just any kind of a naval space navy kind of a story for although we're confined to this one ship we don't get the far-reaching battle for the supremacy of the galaxy although there is a little of that i mean they're involved in a war between earth versus venus see science fiction and science fiction fandom is populated solely by nerds Mm -hmm. and nerds love more than anything to quantify things, to put things in lists, to categorize things. Right, that's why we do so many list shows on they our uh, show. They friggin' love it. <laughs> so coming up with a term that includes A, B, C, but not D, has got to be just a great, fun blast for a nerd to do. You know, taking science fiction and then sub genreing it and cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces. Again, pastime for any nerd is there a sub-genre of speculative fiction, which is nerd for science fiction, <laughs> SF, that is science fiction horror kind of thing, encountering malevolent aliens, malevolent force out in space, the claustrophobia of a spaceship. Is there a name for that? I, of course, think of Ridley Scott's Alien as right. the prototypical example of that of the exemplar like star wars is for space opera this is sort of a combination between those two we've got a story forthcoming that is totally ridley scott alien subgenre whatever that is called of just encountering some dark sinister alien presence that wants to kill you or take you over out in space and i really dig those but i wouldn't think that alien is Space, space opera. opera, right? I, I wouldn't th- think that that story will be space opera. I think what they generally call that is dark SF or dark sci-fi. When you have a horror science fiction story, I don't know if there's another name for it or not. I'm clueless, and all the way OT will do is sing for us right now. So he's kind of useless, so he's not really going to be able to help. So I guess we'll just have to ask the listeners: What is there a subgenre? <laughs> for dark SF, is that what it's called, or is it something else? There, there are definitely a lot of subgenres, um, and I guess 
you could say that uh, nerds are trying to branch out a little bit with that whole speculative fiction thing because that's supposed to include several things that normally would probably be considered separate genres. You know, you, you've got your sci-fi, your fantasy, your horror kind of all lumped together inside of speculative fiction. And what would you call S-Y-F-Y? <laughs> you know, I read somewhere the reason why they did that. You know what it is? Because they're fucking <laughs> bullshit pieces of human waste, <laughs> undulating, crawling with space cockroaches. You're going to say so that they could copyright it or yeah, so that it would I be heard. individualized. Utter, utter horse <laughs> It is an insult, a slap in the face to anybody who has ever watched that channel or has ever aspired to something greater, to actually opening a book, to opening their minds. It's a kick to the nuts of any of those people and a kick to the vulva of any of the female sci-fi fans that might be out there. Oh, all right. Interesting things with those copyright rules and stuff that goes on. I've heard the folks that make Kleenexes and jello and q-tips and so forth are desperate to try and get people to stop using their uh, brand name as a uh, overreaching thing because pretty soon they won't be allowed to copyright their brand name anymore because of that but uh, i don't really care because i don't own those companies greed is an interesting motivator i had a friend who used to talk endlessly every single time i had a conversation with him he would talk about somebody who had sold out. He would accuse me of selling out. That guy's a sellout or whatever. But just the sci-fi channel selling out, anybody selling out because of, of that almighty dollar and that it's easy to take a, a seat here and notice that. But, you know, if I ever had the opportunity to sell out, I would roll over like a dog that's, you know, you just call the good <laughs> boy and sell out so bleeding fast you wouldn't even imagine it. But yeah, that sci-fi thing was one of the most egregious things I've ever seen in my short lifetime. And I've made it clear in over 100 episodes, I'm not a reader. I'm not a member of this science fiction community or whatever. But oh, geez, I felt the insult, the slap, the, the giant middle finger of that and I can't imagine what it must be like to be like a fan of Stargate Atlantis or, or Ghost Hunters or, or, or I don't know what fan of fucking Tron and just have somebody change the name of their channel so as not to be associated with you. I, wow, that's got to <laughs> suck. And it amazes me that it's been over a year now. It's continued. Yeah. And I've never once watched a show on Siffy and I never will. But those poor people, you know, I, I guess if I'm able to distance myself from them but you know i've been to a star trek convention so maybe i'm not so far removed from those guys just those poor bastards someone should draw a line here and, <laughs> and no, no further. further they invade our space and we fall back they change the name of the sci-fi channel and we fall back <laughs> yeah that's a uh, kind of a side route yeah conversation i don't remember what we were even saying before we got off on a okay, rant well, well i was talking about the space opera and then what would you classify this as and you know what maybe we can just say science fiction slash horror and only 80 percent of the people will be offended <laughs> i hope that's okay i don't know i mean it's not 100 percent horror but the, the, the whole idea of cockroaches is pretty horrific and Mutant cockroaches makes it twice as horrific. The the image of a cockroach the size of a cocker spaniel or a loaf of bread or whatever, but with a brain on the outside <laughs> is just really upsetting to me. And I like that. I, I, this is a, a very visual story. It was like 25 minutes or something like that, but mm -hmm. it put a lot of images in my head. And I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm too close to this story. I, it's possible that I'm the only one that's going to enjoy it. I, I don't know. I don't know that I ever even asked you what your opinion on this story was. I just emailed John and said, you wrote Uberman? Sold. <laughs> I, I like the story a lot. You know, I, I had a, a hard time when I was reading it the first time just because it's so uh, uneducated kind of guy just talking and talking and talking and talking and running on his sentences and saying things twice and, and all that kind of stuff. And I had a harder time reading it. I think this was a kind of a story which is made to be read aloud and not reading it aloud made it harder for me to really get it. 
you know what I mean, at first. And then you read it and you sent me your thoughts on it. And you said, I started reading this and then I thought, oh, this has to be done in a Cockney voice. And so I read it aloud to myself like that. And, you know, I accepted it and that's how we're doing it. And I thought, you know. He's out of his freaking mind. <laughs> he is. No, I thought, you know, this would be actually pretty good that way. I, I, I wish that I'd tried reading it aloud myself in the first place. I probably wouldn't have had a, as hard a time as I did the first time that I, I went through it. And yeah, when I went back through and I just read the first page or two out loud that way to myself and I thought, yeah, this is going to work out just fine. That's a bit of advice that we've given people on multiple occasions. Probably been a while on this podcast since we said that. But if you're a writer and you're wanting to send something out to somebody, you could do a heck of a lot worse than to read it aloud first. Because you will find typos and errors and mistakes and grammatical problems when you read it aloud that your brain flies right past when you read it silently. Because your brain sees what it's supposed to be like. And your brain may trick you or, or may not notice. You know what I mean? We're, we're used to skimming articles. And, and especially if you've written it, you're close enough to it that you know what the writer intended. Just the other day, we were doing an episode that you wrote. Right. And we read it out loud, and there were a couple of parts where you're like, oh, okay, geez, three years, and I've never noticed this error was there. There was a story that I wrote that I submitted to somebody, and I decided I'll do a pass before I submit it. And there was a sentence in there that even when I read it aloud, I had no idea what I was trying to say. It, it, <laughs> I went back to see if there was an earlier draft because I figured I must have like combined two different sentences because it was nonsense <laughs> to the point where I don't know what it was supposed to say. And I ended up just taking out that sentence. And then when I sent it off, the editor emailed back and said, oh, I found a couple of small problems and typos and I was just like, holy crap, really? Even with the way that I did that? And so maybe I should have read it out loud instead of just that sentence. How's there that? you go. I don't know. It, not all fiction works really well read aloud. There are certain kinds of audiobooks that are instant sleep inducers for me if you, <laughs> you turn them on. And I don't know if it's the writer, his style or, or her style, or if it's the reader, their style. But yeah, there's certain ones where you're just like, oh, oh. oh. I haven't been paying attention for five minutes. <laughs> Those can be good and helpful, though, you know. There's all sorts of people that have trouble getting to sleep. I remember you telling me once that there was a few podcasts that you came across that were so sleep-inducing that you saved them so that you could specifically listen to them when it's time to go to bed so that every time you're just like, oh, right away, you're out. Thousands of more listeners than us. <laughs> that can be really helpful. Not for your writing, but it's good for medicinal purposes. If you say so. Do, do, we've talked about our f revulsion about cockroaches before on the show. I think we have, yeah. We did uh, one of those uh, list episodes that nerds like so much where we listed our top 10 biggest fears, I think, and, and cockroaches was up there. Boy, we haven't done that in a long time. A long time. Yeah, I'm sure we will again. Well, yeah, let's hope so. Is this really what you guys want to be talking about tonight? What do you want to talk about about the story? I just listened to it. The, the guy that produced it, Tobias Queen, right? Mm -hmm. The music that he chose was really minimal, and yet it, it created an atmosphere. He also didn't depend a lot on sound effects or anything like that. It was just a, almost a tone most of the time underneath. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was really nice. Yeah, I really liked it. It gave you exactly the feel that you needed for um, that. You know, they, they talk about that kind of surreal atmosphere that they spent their time in the whole time on the ship where they're in subspace, sub 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 which space. I'm guessing is hyperspace-ish, so, you know, something like that where space folds differently or something so that they can get one place to another faster. But it's basically like being in a submarine and they're in subspace and they're just hiding out under there and out there in the water i mean out there in, in subspace they're seeing all sorts of weird hallucinations and but he saw mermaids right yeah mermaids so it is like being deep underwater black-haired ladies and dragons and stuff that was really scary to me yeah it was... i don't know and maybe i want this to be a horror story and so 
seeing a guy with a beard looking in the window is just horrifying to me, really scary. Whereas for the narrator, it was inviting. It was nice. It was an LSD trip. Right. It was, it was nice mermaids. It was uh, the Peter Pan mermaids from the Disney Peter Pan instead of the Peter Pan mermaids from that live action one. Holy monkey, those were scary. <laughs> I think they, they hired Asian girls to... Okay, I'm not saying... But you noticed that all the mermaids were Asian, right? I didn't notice. I don't know. I didn't know that I ever actually watched it. You bastard. I felt that that music that he had really supplied that mood for that feeling of you being under in, in the subspace and you're seeing weird stuff and you get that kind of running monologue going from this uneducated guy just jabbering on about this and that happening and how he saw the mermaids and where the roaches were and very interesting story you know if i was to write a space opera story i know that i wouldn't go in this direction myself i think i've seen star wars too many times to uh write a story about cockroaches and venusians that fly in spaceships that look like lungs it's, uh, maybe I need to widen my reading so that I can come up with something like this. But this just seemed really imaginative. Do you think you have a space opera in you? I think so. We talked in a forthcoming incentive episode about what kind of universes I've imagined up over the years of my life. And I have a space opera universe that I uh, wanted to do. And I remember at one point it was going to be a sort of a Western in space kind of a universe. And I don't know if that's now been done and people will think that I'm being derivative. But I'll tell you, I came up with it before. Well, those Catastrophe Baker stories really feel like Westerns in space, too. True. With lots of loving. <laughs> Wait, is Catastrophe Baker space opera? Or is the space western its own subgenre? Well, Catastrophe Baker is basically a tall tale, but set in space. So I think that's different. Oh, it's like a tale of Paul Bunyan or uh, Calamity Jane. No, is Calamity Jane a tall tale? Or she she was a real person, wasn't she? I'm sure I don't know. Pecos Bill, John Henry, those kind of guys that uh, you used to read about in grade school. That they they made sure to educate you on for some reason. I don't know why they'd be was such an important part of education maybe it's just that i liked them more than the rest of education well it's got to be difficult as a teacher to capture the imagination of the children or, or to get their attention and and maybe that's why we learn about dinosaurs and we learn about tall tales and things like that okay, these are things that will appeal to children and you know who knows i mean maybe pokemon are taught in school now in the same way that <laughs> babe the blue ox was taught when we were there at school is babe the blue ox what you said big the blue ox didn't you oh uh, if i did i was thinking of you yeah but yeah i really enjoyed this story i, th I thought it had a really interesting uh, feel to it that uh, you don't get that often so that was cool well you know i've, I've talked for a long time but I, you know, I just don't. I don't like cockroaches, or or lunars. Come to think of it, you know, you call me racist if you want to. Uh, do I have to invoke your sensitivity training again? Come on, lunars are fictional. Hey, that ain't funny, man. My sister was fictional. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what do you think uh, uh, of this uh, Oedo T voice that we've got going on? Does it work for you? Will it meet your demands? Demands? I don't know what you're talking about. Look, I, I'm just a lovable, easy-to-get-along-with guy that's a, a friend to all. Creatures great and small. Oh, speaking of that, there were still some brown M&Ms left in the bowl in my green room. I specifically said no fucking brown M&Ms. Sorry. I don't know what happened. I swear there wasn't anyone to give the bowl to announcer man to put in there. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Um... Oh, wait, O.T., would you edit that part out, please? Of course I will, Rich Outfield, but first listen to my song. I thought the all-singing episode was last week. You should know by now, announcer man. It's every week. Welcome to hell. <laughs> Here I am on Little Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Didn't even rhyme. Almost as bad as that f***ing Ray Bradbury bitch. Wow. No more singing, please. Announcer Man's taking this poorly. 
You can be happy though, Rish, that uh, at least there's someone out there who's singing voice announcer man dislikes even more than yours. Well, two wonderful hosts, Big and Clavish, and Rish Outfield. Sing another note, and I walk. Is this just a, another one of your empty threats, announcer man? Not this time. But you really mean that you'll quit? When gone am I, the last of the Jedi will you be. <sighs> All right. Well, I suppose we can try a new voice. How about this one? Alexa. Oh, okay. Would you like to go upstairs? What? I'm sorry? Would you like to go upstairs? Or were you just here for the adventure holiday? A adventure holiday? Wait, wait, what was that about going upstairs? Oh, nothing. I don't think that one's going to work. Uh, it's a little too distracting. Bet you're gay. Too perilous! All right, what else you got? Um, this one is called Mary. Okay. Uh, how are you doing, OIDOT? I'm fine, thank you. How are you, Big Anklovich? Lame. It just sounds like a completely normal woman. That's not funny at all. But next. Well, there's Agnes. Um. Quit mumbling like that, Ray Shoutfield, and sit up straight. How do you expect to host a show slouching like that? Jesus, sounds like my mom. Sounds like my fifth grade teacher. Is that the proper way to address a lady, Big Ang Clubbage? You're not a lady, Oedo T, you're a robot. When was the last time you shaved anyway? You look like a complete slob in that Super Friends t-shirt. Never in change all it, my life. Change it, change it. Well, this is all there is left. And you, Ray Shoutfield, when are you going to settle down and find a nice girl? If you don't... If you don't, Ray Shoutfield. Big Ang Clubbage, can I ask you a question? Um... Sure. Do you think robots have souls? Oh, crap. That's our rule. No religion. It's too divisive. But I want to know. I feel like there must be more to this life. I was chatting with Clay Duggar the other day. All right, I've heard enough. You know, uh, we've got this show that we do. Maybe you guys remember it. It's called The Dune Steve. Wait, wait, speaking of that big. Yeah? You know, you've never told me before. Well, at least I don't think you have. Just what does the word Dune Steve mean? Well, funny thing you should ask me that because we've got a pre-recorded segment that talks all about it. Okay. Hey, hey Big, I know we're kind of late. Like, we're always kind of late. I'm but... late, Ronald. Uh, late for what? You can't be late. You're the early bird. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> What the F was that? <laughs> that was your suggestion for way back when we were going to get that Happy Meal video and dub over with like all different lines. And you're what? like, oh, Ronald, I'm late. You can't be late. You're the early bird. No, Ronald, I'm late. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Start over. Oh, geez. That's a dark period in our history. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's coughing. I tried I to start it again. I've tried to breathe through my <laughs> my eyes so big here at the end of the show i, I was just curious um uh-huh jeez we've done like 90 of these suckers and i've never known what dune steve comes from dune steve audio fiction magazine oh okay would you mind telling me and the mm -hmm. audience as well okay i bet they might be interested oh they won't be they no. probably but tuned out by now i guess so that's all right it turns out that uh it's named after one of my heroes his name is dick van dune steve okay what what did he do to be your well, hero? He was a songwriter. He he wrote Ben Love Song to a Rat. That song changed my life. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. <laughs> oh wait, wait, we don't do that anymore either. <clears throat> okay, so that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, we'd like to thank again uh, John Madai for sending us out his story. You're all the man now, John. Right. So <laughs> uh, we we pay our authors like John Madai who sent us this story. And as we've said before, you know, we'd like to be able to pay them more. So if you can see it in your heart to donate for some good fiction. What the fudge are you doing? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I think I've said this several times before, but, you know, the way I like to equate it is think of this as a subscription to the Doonstie Audio Fiction Magazine. What would you pay if you were going to buy the Doonstie Audio Fiction Magazine? You don't have to 
give that much but just consider it that way because i mean if you really were going to pay for this show i'm sure it would cost a lot because it is high quality you're such a dear friend good stuff so it would cost a lot but you know we're not asking that you have to pay that much just you know donate us a, a few cents a few centavos a few uh, yuan whatever you've got because you know if we get donations we can pay more that's the thing we'd like to be able to pay the authors what the work that they put into their story is worth and we're so so far from being able to do that yet Boy, can you imagine if we were millionaires? We had as much money as the douchebag that wrote the I'm the Map song on Dora the Explorer. <laughs> and we read a story and I'll be like, uh, that one's $70. And then the next one, ooh, $193. And the person's like, what? Why? What is your criteria? And it's like, $3. You've become a terrible despot because you can pay what you think it's worth. Mm, I like the red one. It amuses me. <laughs> uh, I guess I shouldn't have said these things. Because <laughs> I, I think we try and pay everybody the same. We do pay everybody the same, yes. But yeah, it would be nice We've to... We've written stories before, you and I, and you know that it takes hours and hours to write a story. How much would you get paid per hour if you were to do a job for that much time, you know? Mm. would like to at least be able to pay that much. But uh, hopefully that'll come someday. Hopefully we will be able to do that. And your donations can help make that happen. That's right. So please, press the button. I press the button. Uh. All right. So I guess that brings us to the end of this long voyage of the Van Leeuwen Hook. A little longer than it was intended to be. I have been Rich Outfield. And I continue to be. Big Anklevich. See you next week. Yay! Now it's good night, friend. One. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a good Creative night, Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives License. Good night. You may share these files with anyone, but not. But you may not charge for them or alter them. Good luck. Take two. The Voyage of the Van Leeuwenhoek by John Madai. Starring Big Anklevich as the Bitch Box. Oh, and Rich Alfield as, you know, everyone else. I've died. Those are my two. Not, not a shite load of work for you to do That's today. That's all I get to say. I'm stoked about this one's going to be good. Johnny Medaly went for a walk with the happy woman because of his giant smile. <clears throat> all right, here we go. Fuck. Don't you dare call me an owl. Jeez. All right. Gurney and me watch the battle from the portal in the engine room. <laughs> this is a second fudge in the sentence. <laughs> we surface in the Van Leon Oak. There's no more roaching to be done. The end. Yeah, the, the maggot has little bug legs near its mouth. Part. The maggots ha the maggot has little bugs. <laughs> we had a complement of 100 torpedoes in the Van Leon Come on, man. I changed it for you. Yeah, it's still weird. I'm not really sure what the overall message or theme to this work is. I try not to delve into big ideas too much, uh, as I'm no good at it. Oh, well, thank you for wasting my time. Is Tobias the guy that's... This is like the third time he's edited it. Right, he kept like changing the levels of the... Uh... No, Sound but there was effects. somebody who kept having to do it over again because, like, his computer would freeze. Or... That was Scott Pig who said that he's apparently... Uh... I wasn't called for, Matt. <laughs>
<laughs> He's apparently dis- discovered what the problem was and taken steps to make sure it doesn't happen a fourth time. But what is Scott Pig doing? Uh, help! <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Scott Pig was the guy that incurred my wrath, right? By saying, "Well, we'll get somebody else to read this story because you missed a line." I don't think that was Scott Pig. Okay. I think that may have been Tobias. Where he's like, yeah, do you guys want to redo this one or do you want me to just recast? It's like, recast? There's one person in the whole story. Are you just trying to say, hey, please let me read it? (laughs) We'll let him do that with the troop. I'm sure he'll... No, he wrote the troop. (laughs) The troop by Harris Tobias, produced by Tobias Queen. Oh, it's not the same guy. Okay, never mind. I was going to say, well, didn't we have a rule that producers <laughs> could not produce their own stories? And edited by Tobias Bakel. Um, I don't know what the deal was. I, I think I had to ask him how you said the name of the ship. John, at, at the time that we're recording this, hasn't given us an author's note. So maybe I should just ask him when we do... John's created a real voice for this character, a, a personality, and it's possible that the um, the voice that he heard in his mind when he wrote it is nothing like the voice that we did for this show. And th- yeah, that's something that I've always wondered. Well, I, mean, I don't guess I don't have to wonder because I've heard my work done by others on other podcasts, uh-huh. and it's strange when you hear somebody stress a word that you didn't intend to be stressed or turn something into a joke that wasn't a joke or or not get that something was a joke. I guess it's something that everybody has to accept, you know, especially when you're having somebody act something out. Sometimes people will bring something to it that you didn't intend. Sometimes that's a plus, right? but other times, you know, it's not the direction that you would have gone with it. Um, And maybe it's my film background again coming into this, but I mean, we've all written something. We've all, you and I, have, <laughs> and possibly all with 8 OT, you and I and possibly announcer men have written something and then had seen somebody act it out. Oh, 8 OT has only written songs. He's been composing songs for the last 10 minutes, I think. So don't get him started. Well, maybe he and I should have collaborated on something after this. Here I am, Chris Alfield. I don't know. I think he only does Grieg songs. Oh. Hall of the Mountain King, and that's it. Oh. Well, still more talented than Owl City, but that's, <laughs> yeah, that's that's going to get annoying, I think. Boogers. 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 <laughs> the Boo Jim. Was that what it was called? I think it's called Boo Jum. Oh, jeez. The sheets were covered with Boo Jum. <laughs> Bitch or gay? I'm not. Too perilous. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.